In the late 1880s, German chemists produced a substance with a smell so powerful that it caused widespread discomfort, nausea, and unconsciousness. Less than a hundred years later, British researchers attempted to produce the very same chemical with similarly horrifying results. The putrid chemical claimed to be behind all this hysteria is known as thioacetone, and it is listed as the foulest smelling substance on Earth. Only a few records detailing human interaction with it exist, and no pictures or videos have ever been published. Let's fix that. In the world of sneaky chemicals, there are a few main groups that stand out. Indoles, such as scatol, tend to smell like feces, while organic amine compounds usually have an odor similar to fish or rotting flesh. The most notorious compounds, however, are the organosulfur compounds. These pungent chemicals are responsible for the smell of things like garlic, skunks, natural gas, and even flatulence. And it is in this vile family that we meet the world's stinkiest substance, thioacetone. At first glance, thioacetone is nothing special. Essentially, it is just acetone with the oxygen substituted by a sulfur atom. But that is where the similarities end. In contrast to acetone, thioacetone is an unstable, water-insoluble compound that has a tendency to rapidly polymerize. At room temperature, it is a volatile, orangish liquid, but it must be kept cool in something like a dry ice bath to prevent spontaneous polymerization. Still, it can exist in the air long enough to be smelled, which is how the substance gained notoriety. Unfortunately for curious people like me, thioacetone's odor has never been formally described by the people who made it. Most sources simply refer to it as intensely foul, and some have gone as far as to say the smell is indescribable. I kind of doubt this, however, so I made it my personal goal to synthesize thioacetone and put its heinous smell to the test, so that the rest of the world could finally see what the real deal is truly like. To make thioacetone, the following reagents are necessary. Acetone, zinc chloride, hydrochloric acid, and hydrogen sulfide. I produce my hydrogen sulfide via the aluminum chloride sodium polysulfide pathway, which I detailed in a previous video. Unfortunately though, I didn't have any zinc chloride on hand, so my first task was to make some. To do this, I simply added about 25 milliliters of hydrochloric acid to an excess of zinc metal. After fizzing for about an hour, the acid was mostly depleted and the zinc metal was filtered off. The obtained zinc chloride solution was then boiled down and dried on my hot plate, leaving me with just over 6 grams of dry product. Now, with the zinc chloride ready, I began mixing up the reaction solution. To prepare the solution, 5 milliliters of acetone was added to a 4 dram vial, followed by a scoop of zinc chloride, which was swirled around until dissolved. The amount isn't super important, since the zinc chloride only serves as a catalyst in this reaction. Once dissolved, a single drop of hydrochloric acid was added to increase the acidity. And just like that, the mixture was primed and ready for the main reaction. The process for making thioacetone entails bubbling several liters of highly toxic hydrogen sulfide through a flammable solvent, so I was naturally a bit cautious with my approach. The whole setup was sealed with grease, and the gas outlet was directed through a bubbler filled with bleach, which destroys hydrogen sulfide and most organosulfur compounds on contact. The vial with the acetone solution was loaded into an Erlenmeyer flask on top of a magnetic stirrer, and a two-hole stopper was used to seal the vessel. A glass tube attached to the output of the hydrogen sulfide generator was fed through one stopper hole and into the vial, while the other stopper hole was connected to a hose leading to the bleach trap. Overall, the setup was a bit crude, but I think it served its purpose quite well. Once everything was set up, it was finally time to start the dreaded reaction. An addition funnel was charged with aluminum trichloride solution, and the stopcock was carefully opened, allowing some of it to mix with the sodium polysulfide solution in the flask below. If you want to see why I made these solutions, go check out my recent hydrogen sulfide video, where I explain everything in much greater detail. Upon mixing, hydrogen sulfide slowly began to evolve and fill the system, and soon, gas began bubbling through the acetone solution. At this point, for safety reasons, I postponed filming and opened the garage door for ventilation. Looking at the bleach trap, you can probably tell why this was a good idea. The cloudiness is from hydrogen sulfide being oxidized into elemental sulfur, which is insoluble and crushes out. Of course, catching all the hydrogen sulfide is nearly impossible, so small amounts began to escape. Even with good ventilation, I could still smell the hydrogen sulfide when I was near the setup. And much to my delight, that was not the only thing I could smell. Alright, that is the thioacetone synthesis, and I think we have a success on our hands. Right now, the smell, even from right here, is overpowering, which is impressive because I've smelled a lot of bad things. Shockingly though, there was little to no thioacetone present at this time, since it readily polymerizes into trithioacetone as it is produced. Here you can see the main reaction, where the oxygen on the acetone and the sulfur on the hydrogen sulfide essentially swap places, producing water and thioacetone, which immediately polymerizes into the trimer. Because I'm not wearing a respirator or anything like that, and I'm worried about the hydrogen sulfide, I literally have to run out 
get a breath of fresh air, and then run back in here to do whatever I need to do. It is that risky and smelly. Speaking of smelly, I feel like now is a good time to describe the odor of trithioacetone. I would say that it is very similar to the smell of natural gas, but more thick and sulfurous, with an almost meaty character to it. To give you some idea of how bad this stuff smells, my whole family opted to leave the house because a tiny amount managed to slip inside while the synthesis was happening. It took days for the smell to disappear, and the entire garage had to be scrubbed down with bleach water, which still didn't kill the smell entirely. Seriously, this stuff is no joke. Anyways, by the end of the day, hydrogen sulfide production had ceased and the solution had turned milky white. Trithioacetone is an insoluble liquid just above room temperature, and my garage was quite hot, so this comes as no surprise. I tried chilling it in ice water, but nothing I tried was able to break the emulsion. Still, I wanted a sample of the trimer without the zinc chloride and residual hydrogen sulfide mixed in, so the next day I took half of my sample and washed it with saturated sodium bicarbonate solution. This converted the soluble zinc chloride into insoluble zinc carbonate, and it also served to neutralize any hydrogen sulfide and hydrochloric acid still left in solution. Once neutralized, I added a bit of diethyl ether to the solution to pull out the trithioacetone. The zinc carbonate precipitate kind of made separating the ether layer a pain, but eventually I was able to complete a few washings, which were subsequently combined and left outside to evaporate down. In the end, I had a small amount of clear liquid which smelled very similar to the original mixture, but somewhat less eggy and more fecal. At this point, I had basically gone as far as any recorded home chemist had ever gone. A few old Science Madness posts indicated that one or two other people had successfully produced the trimer in the past, but as far as I know, none had dared to crack it into the monomer. For those who don't know, cracking is the process of heating a substance until it breaks into smaller molecules. For polymerized thioacetone, this is reported to occur at roughly 500 degrees Celsius. However, according to the German account from 1889, even a simple steam distillation should be enough to befoul the air with thioacetone. So in theory, all I had to do was blowtorch some of the trithioacetone mixture to break it down into the thioacetone monomer. And that's exactly what I did. All right, we're out in basically the middle of nowhere. There's very few people around, so this hopefully won't be offending anybody. But now the only thing we have left to do is torch it to convert the trimer into the monomer form. So I guess now we just have to go do it. I got my dad with me. He'll be. I'm He'll here be. for moral support. <laughs> He'll be helping judge whether this is as bad as I think it might be. So, unbiased third party. Let's go. After some initial assessment, our first major cracking test was conducted on the organosulfur compounds extracted from the original mixture. The amount of trithioacetone present in this vial was next to negligible. The smell produced, however, was far from insignificant. Oh! Ooh, Ooh. Oh, yeah. Whoa. That is kind of bad. Ooh. It's like sulfur, but it's not. It's like... Got a ripeness to it. And we haven't really even done a whole lot of it yet. That's impressive. Oh, man. Oh! <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I got a big whiff of that. So... The smell of thioacetone is probably just as strong as people say it is. I'm personally not as sensitive to it because I can tolerate sulfury smells, but if you are someone who cannot tolerate the smell of like sulfur or natural gas, then you probably would be gagging right about now. I would describe the smell as Kind of like natural gas, but like more rank and sulfury, and uh, just kind of like gets up in your nose. <laughs> it's just overall pretty nasty stuff. So, yeah, let's see how far away we can smell it. All right, so we're gonna set up the torch so that it's kind of running. Hope you can see it down there, and then we're gonna walk that way downwind and see how far it is that we can still smell it. Let's go. Let's see how far we can go. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. 
What do you think we are? I think you can just kind of still smell a little bit. That is my dad. And that's how far away we could smell it. I'm impressed. All right, so we measured the distance and it was what? 225 feet. 225 feet. We're calling it a wind-aided 225 feet. The first batch was not as as uh, reduced as what this was. This yeah. was, I couldn't even tell there's hardly anything in it. So it was like, it was- A few milligrams. Yeah, a couple of eyedroppers was what got heated up just now. And it was a lot more, it was a lot more pungent than the first batch. And yeah, so I can imagine if they had that, that same stuff, I'm sure that could cause quite a, a Yeah, mess. like in the factories and stuff. Yeah. After that test, we decided to torch the remaining trithioacetone and see what horrors would result. With the larger amount, you can actually see the color change from off-white to an orangish-red color, and later to a shade of brown. Thioacetone is reported to appear in these colors, so this was a nice visual confirmation of successful thermal cracking. The other indication of our success was the horrific change in smell that soon resulted. Oh, that's way worse. Oh. They added like this kind of oniony garlic stuff to it. Oh man, that is vile. The smell like changed. It's still very sulfury, but it's like, oh, it's like something else. In addition to the thick sulfurous natural gas smell that dominates the odor of trithioacetone, another layer of stench resulted upon cracking. The best way I can describe it is oniony or similar to a leak. To me, the smell was not overwhelming, but it was remarkably potent. Now, I'm sure that more than a few of you will be a bit dubious after seeing me handle the world's stinkiest substance without throwing up or passing out. To better understand why this is, let's take a look at the original lab papers detailing the infamous German thioacetone incident. Translated to English, the paper says the following. It is worth noting here that the odor in the laboratory was no more objectionable than when working with known sulfides and mercaptans. Interestingly, the following quote can also be found in the same text. Residents on the streets adjacent to the laboratory complained that the odorous substance had caused some people to faint, feel sick, and vomit. So why the apparent contradiction? Well, perhaps the label of worst smell in the world should also come with a disclaimer, results may vary. Different people react to different smells in different ways, so it makes sense that some people might be more affected than others. If you want a good example of this, go check out Nile Blue's video on making the US government's standard bathroom malodorant. Upon smelling the mixture, Nigel didn't seem too phased, while at the same time, his colleagues appeared much more affected. Additionally, exposure to certain strong smells can cause eventual desensitization, so enduring the smell of trithioacetone for over three days might have helped me take on the monomer with greater ease. Direct exposure also appears to be less offensive than dilute exposure, according to most sources. In the end, I feel like thioacetone mostly lives up to the legends. I'm sure if you release this compound indoors or outdoors in sufficient quantity, that it could cause the discomfort and nausea most often associated with it. But for small batches like this, I would say the worst thing you have to worry about would be awkward stares, a stinky lab space, and maybe some nausea or discomfort if you are sensitive to strong smells. So there you have it, making the foul smelling substance on earth. Thank you all very much for watching, I had a great time making this video, and I hope you all learned something in the process. If you like what you see, consider donating or supporting my work on Patreon, the links, as always, are down below. Remember to like, share, and subscribe if you want to see more of my content, and click the bell if you want to know whenever I'm uploading. Stay safe everyone, and I'll catch you next time. Lab Coats, out. You gonna sneak up on me? I was gonna sneak up on you and put my face in there, but I didn't do it. <laughs> you done? Yeah, I'll be done. Lab coats out.